as Diane just introduced, what Khan Academy is most known for is this library of videos that I started producing uh, uh, almost five, six years ago now. Uh, so, so before I go any further, let me just show you all a little bit of a, of a mix of, of, of what the videos actually look like, and then we can go a little deeper from there. So the hypotenuse is now going to be five. This animal's fossils are only found in this area of South America, a nice clean band here, and this part of Africa. We could integrate over the surface, and the notation usually is a capital sigma, National Assembly. They create the Committee of Public Safety, which sounds like a very nice committee. Notice, <laughs> this is an aldehyde, and it's an alcohol. Start differentiating into effector and memory cells. A galaxy, hey, there's another galaxy. Oh look, there's another galaxy. And for dollars, is there 30 million plus the 20 million dollars from the American manufacturer? If this does not blow your mind, then you have no emotion. <laughs> uh, so I, I um, you know, the videos, is, uh, there's, there's now 2,200 of them. Uh, that's kind of what I want to do until, you know, I, I get hit by a bus or, or hopefully won't be for a while. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, but uh, 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 we're doing a lot more than that. I mean, the, the videos are reaching, actually now, uh, on the order of about 2 million unique users a month. Uh, uh, we've had almost 45 million video views. They're being watched two to 300,000 times a day. Uh, but, but before I go any deeper, you know, I, I actually just gave a talk at, at, uh, at TED down in Long Beach a couple of weeks ago, and I don't want this to be a repetition of this, of that talk. I want this to kind of be a part two. But before I go any further, I want to get a sense, just so I know how much background and depth I need to give. How many of y'all have seen that talk? Okay, a good, a good, a, and, and how many of y'all have been to the site? Because I want to know how much background. Okay, very good, very good. Um, so what I want to focus on uh, today is, is kind of, Going a little bit deeper, I will give a, a background about what we're doing beyond the video portion, now that it isn't just me, that we are actually are kind of a, 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 a team now. We're, we're at six people. And then, and, 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 and then address uh, some of the questions that I think have, have surfaced as, as we've gotten a little bit more popular and, and we've started to enter into domains that, frankly, I never thought we would enter, especially uh, in, into the classroom itself. But before I do that, I want to give you all a little bit of a, a thought experiment. Uh, imagine if, if we're in a juggling class and I'm your, I'm your juggling instructor. And this week, we are going to learn to juggle oranges. And so I give you all your orange juggling kits. I give you all each four oranges, and I give you all a little lecture on juggling oranges. And I say, practice, and in a week, I will assess your orange juggling ability. And so you practice, and a week later, I come back with my clipboard, and I, I say, juggle. And so you, you try the best you can to, to juggle, and you know, different three oranges, four oranges, all the rest. And I say, oh, you know, can't juggle four oranges at all. Uh, uh, three oranges barely can keep the, the, the oranges in the air for, for more than a few seconds. You are a 70% orange juggler. You are a D orange juggler. And I place that, that label on your forehead. I put it in your, in your permanent uh, record, uh, making it all, all but impossible for you to go to an elite juggling school. <laughs> and despite those deficiencies that you clearly have in, in your abilities, I, there's a state-mandated jugg juggling uh, uh, curriculum that we have to follow. And there's a calendar that specifies this, how we have to move forward. We have this kind of assembly line. And so I say, well, give me back the oranges. The next lesson, here are some knives. <laughs> and as, as, as crazy as, as that might appear to be, uh, uh, that's exactly what's happening in our classrooms right now. Uh, uh, the, the, it might not be as physically dangerous, uh, uh, but, but it is just as mentally dangerous. We have students, they take an exam, they get 10% wrong, 20% wrong, 30% wrong. You can even fail an exam. Uh, and regardless of the fact that we've identified those deficiencies, we know that the student doesn't know those concepts, we have to move on to the next concept. We have this assembly line that the only thing we're using the test for is to put labels on people's foreheads, to separate them, to track them. But then when we know that there's weaknesses, we push them forward, and we're pretty much ensuring that at some future point they're going to fail. We're pretty much ensuring that motivated kids, even if they have awesome teachers, at some point those gaps are going to come back, and they're not going to be able to perform once they get to uh, some more advanced mathematics. So now that, that we've, we've gotten a, a funding, uh, you know, and just so you know a little bit of the story of uh, how, how all of this happened, I was literally uh, uh, making videos in my, in my closet for, uh, uh, for about five years. 
Um, and, and then uh, uh, about a year ago, Google brought me over to their campus. And you know, I, I thought it was just like you know, a lot of the Google engineers, they, they, as parents, they were using the, these videos for their children and all of that. But they brought me into a conference room. And they said, Sal, what, what would you do at $2 million? And, and, <laughs> And I, and I said, is this an education context or just as a broader question? <laughs> <laughs> is this a, a uh, they're very different answers. Um, but uh, so, so that happened. And then a, a little bit later, and this is actually, I mean, this is like last year. I, I was still in the closet. Um, <laughs> the, 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 um, uh, I, I get a call from, from uh, Larry Cohen, who's Bill Gates' chief of staff, and, and, and says, Oh, I don't know if you realize this, but, but Bill Gates likes your videos. He watches them, he uses with his, his, his kids, and, and he would like to support you. Um, w w do you have some time to meet him in the near future? And I said, oh, I, th I think I can move around my calendar a little bit. <laughs> I think I can push back a few of the video recordings here or there. Um, but, but you fast forward to, to October of this year. Uh, we got funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We got the funding from Google. And uh, uh, it, it essentially allowed me to come out of the closet. And, and, <laughs> And, and, and what, what, what we're now trying to do there is uh, take these videos to, the, to, their, to their natural conclusion and, and address that juggling mastery problem. So what we're doing, if you go to the site, and it's all free, it's a not-for-profit, uh, not trying to sell anything, you can start at 1 plus 1 equals 2, and, keep, and, and we'll give you as many problems as you need, and as you get 10 in a row, you can keep advancing to more and more advanced concepts. And so the, the, the paradigm here is don't move on to a next concept until you, the, until you master the one you already know. And so as an organization, what we're trying to do, and, and it seems like there's already a little bit, we're getting the traction here, and we'll talk later in the talk about why we think we're getting that traction. What we're trying to do is enable anyone, anywhere in the world, for free, to get, one, an education, but when we say an education, to get an education that really is a mastery-based education, one that really ensures that someone understands the basics before they move forward, and they can do it all at their own pace. And I want to be clear, and this is actually, and this will, you know, we'll talk more about this at the second half of the talk. This isn't a new idea. It's and actually nothing, nothing that Khan Academy doing is fundamentally new. Doing videos uh, either online or even on TV or whatever, it's, it's not a new idea. When, the, when radio was first invented, when TV was first invented, people thought it was going to revolutionize education. Put the best teachers, broadcast them. It, it never happened. Even when uh, the internet was first in, uh, kind of came out, they thought that was going to be the killer app in, on uh, for the internet. When the, when the PC was first invented, they thought this was the first time we can give people self-paced learning, but it, it never got traction. So in the second half of my talk, I'd like to think a little bit uh, about maybe why we're getting traction. It's a super important question for, for us as an organization because we don't want to lose uh, uh, whatever that, that, that secret sauce might be. The other interesting thing that's happened, and I talk a, a lot more about this in, in the other TED talk, uh, is, and, and it, was, it was actually a big surprise to me, is that our software and videos start to get adopted in the classroom. And, and, and I mentioned in the previous talk that it happened early on, even before we got funding or anything, I started getting letters from teachers who were saying that they were using just the videos to flip the education model. They were now assigning the videos for a lecture. Uh, they were assigning the videos for homework. And instead of doing a lecture in the classroom, they were actually doing they were actually allowing their students to interact with each other and doing problems. And so they actually, just with that simple technology, just the on-demand video, they were actually able to kind of personalize and, and make the actual classroom experience interactive. And so now with this, uh, this kind of self-paced, mastery-based learning software, uh, we were approached by the Los Altos School District, not too far from here, what would you do with a classroom? And uh, we said, well, we would let every student work at their own pace. And the teacher's role would be, to, they'd have a dashboard, they would have all of the data, and only intervene on the students that are stuck. And so you could do a very focused intervention and, and be armed with the right data to do it, and, or even better, get a student who's already proficient in that to intervene for the, on that student. And then you get all of the benefits of learning something even deeper uh, when you yourself are the teacher. So they, they decided to do it. And so in Los Altos, we have two fifth grade classes and two seventh grade classes, and they're using this as their, their core curriculum. And, and what I want to emphasize here, and it's not always made clear, is when, pe when, you talk, when I talk about this to people, a lot of people say, oh, this is awesome, you know, uh, self-paced learning, mastery-based, differentiated instruction. But there is a, a crowd that starts to get a little suspicious. They start saying, well, this sounds 
like you're, you know, this, you're automating things, but it sounds like it's, it's very robotic. It sounds like, you know, kids in front of a, of a, uh, in front of a computer just, you know, doing exercises all day, listening to videos, not interacting with each other. It sounds like you're marginalizing the teacher. It sounds like you're de-skilling the teacher, that you're making them kind of just, just do what, what, the, what the computers can't. And what I want to emphasize here is it's the exact opposite. What we're seeing in those classrooms in Los Altos is we're seeing every moment of that teacher's time is spent interacting with, with her students, being a mentor. These students are getting one-on-one -on -one with the teacher multiple times a week. When, we were, when I was in school, I was lucky to get that you know, even a, a few times and even in your, in your whole career, multiple times a week. They aren't, they aren't doing this at the expense of project-based learnings or investigations. What this is allowing the teacher to do, it liberates the classroom. So now that they can do more of the project-based learning, they can do more of the investigations. These classrooms in Los Altos, there is more of that creative activity, more of this interaction, more of this, uh, of this experimenting with the world than you would see in any other classroom. So for the first time, because we have this technology, it's not an either-or proposition. You have these kind of camps of mathematical instruction. Do you do kind of the traditional, uh, um, do a lot of problems lecture and, and, and see a lot of traditional problems, or do you do the project-based learning where you investigate things? And our answer is now we can, we can do both. And even better, even on the instruction itself, there's these debates between old math and new math. Uh, how do you do it? And the value when you have on-demand video, you can do both. You can actually expose the students to every possible way that there is to learn mathematics. And in the same classrooms, you have one kid doing third grade math and you have one kid doing algebra, and that's great that the student doing the third grade math needs to be doing the third grade math. He or she needs to fill out those gaps. And the student who's doing the algebra should, allow, should be able to run forward and do the algebra. And then some people say, oh, well, this is bad. You know, already the smart kids have the advantage and the slow kids, you know, they already have every disadvantage. And now you're making the spread even wider. But what they don't realize is in these same classes, it's becoming impossible to figure out over a longer term who those smart kids are and who the slower kids are. Because even though one kid is working on third grade math for a little while, once he or she is getting those gaps, and we see it over and over again, they're able to race ahead. And then three weeks later, they've passed up the kid who's in algebra. So all of these kind of uh, labels start to disappear. The other, um, the other thing that you know, we're kind of thinking about it as we grow our organization, and, and we, we really want to make sure we have a good hold on it, is why is it working? Why is it resonating? You know, th these ideas have existed forever. On-demand video, self-paced learning. And you know, the, the, first, the, the real data points we've been getting, obviously, we've had the user growth. We've had the traction. Uh, Bill Gates uses it. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but for me personally, the real, the real data points has just been the, the, the user testimonies, the, the letters that we get. And actually, you know, the first feedback has turned into a little bit of a one-liner was from my cousins who, uh, you know, their very first feedback when I'd put 20 or 30 videos up for them, uh, they said that they, they preferred me on YouTube than in person. <laughs> and they, but, but, uh, uh, but, but you know, we, we just keep getting them. And, and I think there's, you know, there's a common theme here, and I'll just, I'll just read a couple real quick. But, you know, there's one. My eldest kid is dancing around in my room here because she is so excited that she finally saw, found someone that teaches like this. And, you know, I, and I feel a little uncomfortable. I don't like doing the self-praise. I mean, you know, I don't... But, but, but what's cool here, what's cool here is that this, this girl, she wasn't just happy. When she learned something, when she was actually able to connect with the material, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to get an A on the exam. She felt the visceral desire to dance. <laughs> That's... And, and there's all, all sorts, you know, this is a, a letter, and this takes me back to my, my college days when, when I didn't have a girlfriend. Uh, I, I don't know if these boys at Bellarmine can relate to this comment. Uh, but, but, so this is a comment from a college student. There's always so much else that a student has on their mind. What is the pretty girl looking like today? What was the professor like when they were a student? Should I talk to the pretty girl after class? Will I include last weekend's event in a book about my life? that the slightest drifting of focus quickly turns into a fruitless two hours spent daydreaming or unconscious. Please continue what you are doing. <laughs> Let's see. And it was actually a much, letter, uh, a much longer letter that I had to redact. It wasn't appropriate for this, for this, <laughs> this audience. It was, uh... And then this is one I got, I got two days ago. I've taken Calculus 1 three times. The first time I didn't pass the class, the second time I had to drop the class. 
My girlfriend's mom told me about this site. She heard about it at a conference. I checked it out. I began supplementing, proceeding, and sometimes even replacing my lectures with your videos, and I received an 84% on my first midterm. She, this is the third time he's taking it. I almost cried. I was so happy. And you know, I, when, I, when I first read it, I was like, you know, 84, that's a good score. Why is he crying? Especially because the class average was a 47%. <laughs> that's the... Uh, now the second midterm is coming up. I feel confident enough to say that I will most likely get an A in the class. Since my major depends on me passing the class, I want to thank you for helping me save my college career. So it's pretty, you know, a, 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 a mind, mind, mind blowing stuff. And, and I, think, I, th I think you can imagine why I, I quit my day job as a hedge fund manager, but wasn't, wasn't quite as much psychic reward. Uh, but, but I... I, I I, I, but I, I think the takeaway here is, is that, and this is the learning that we have, and this thing that we never want to forget as an organization, is that people come to the Khan Academy wanting to just fill in a gap. They have an exam. They want to pass an exam. But once they actually experience what it's like to learn, it doesn't matter who they are. It could be the student who's about to drop out. Once they actually experience it for the first time in life, they get addicted. It's a natural high. It's, it's, it's something that we innately all humans uh, want to have. And that's something as an organization we don't want to ever forget, that if we can form these human bonds using technology, that's what's actually going to allow us to succeed. And so I want to leave you with one quick uh, um, little an uh, story from, from one of the Los Altos classrooms uh, last week that kind of hits, hits the point home. There was a reporter from NBC uh, doing a story on, on, on what we're doing in that classroom, and there's a little fifth grader, and she's doing trigonometry. And actually, all of the boys are very envious of her because she has the most badges and points and all of that other things. And uh, the reporter sits down next to her and says, do you think this is fifth grade math? And then the little girl has a mischievous smile, and, and she looks at the reporter and she goes, no, I think it's sixth grade. <laughs> Thank you.